Resources in the sea are under international law governed by UNCLOS. And it is UNCLOS which determines who is entitled to what, really. And here you see the clash now between China's historical claim, the 9 9, as, and international law, or UNCLOS. Next slide, please. Uh, we go back to the note verbal. <laughs> no? When they issued the first note verbal with the map, there were protests against it submitted by Malaysia and Vietnam. Two years later, the Philippines also made a belated one. But also Indonesia. And the response of China was this. Again, repeat, reiterating indisputable sovereignty over the South, over the island South China Sea of waters and the sovereignty. And then saying that China's sovereignty related to jurisdiction in South China Sea is supported by the historical and legal evidence. Okay. Next. It goes on to continue no? that since the 1930s they published this and therefore the Nash Islands were really fine and then they invoke UNCLOS as well as their own domestic laws implementing UNCLOS and then concluding that the Nash Islands, the Spark Islands are fully entitled to territorial sea, economic zone and continental shelf. This 2011 note indicates that China no? um, can be interpreted to, to, to be simply claiming the islands, as well as the maritime zones around them, in accordance with international law. Because they make reference to laws. Okay. Next slide. The problem is, okay, the problem is they also issued statements that contradict that position, such as this one. So here, again, to illustrate, those two areas are this area two and four. It happens to be inside one of the nine dash lines. And they, this is open water, there are no islands there. And yet they're protesting it on the basis of historic title and sovereign rights and jurisdiction. Within that area, there's no possible historic title in favor of China because historic title and international law cannot be a claim to open seas. At best, historic titles international law will apply to base or areas close to the coastline. And historic title is based on actual usage. That means they must be able, there must have been continuous Chinese activity in this area in order for there to be historic title. But obviously there has been none. You can ask. It's, it's open seas. Okay. And so this is why uh, um, um, China's ambiguity, no? uh, its refusal, uh, no, no, sorry, this is why China's position is regarded by the international community to still be ambiguous because you have uh, contradictory statements, contradictory uh, declarations of policy about it. And that is one of the issues that we have brought before the tribunal for a decision. Next slide. Please. Now, let's talk about now the, how these disputes came about. No? Uh, and particularly focus on the, on the evolution of the Philippine claim. Next slide. First of all, the starting point of all these disputes is actually much, much farther. As early as 1933. Because in 1933, uh, the French, you know, who were the colonial powers in Vietnam, you know, um, issued an official document annexing the Spratly Islands, certain Spratly Islands, uh, and placing them under French sovereignty. This is published in the uh, official the, the official gazette, basically, of, of France. And they lay claim to these islands, okay? uh, nine islands in the Spratlys. When that happened, all of a sudden there was a howl of protest from Japan and China, which at the time had not yet been, become communist. Okay? Uh, Japan apparently had, since the 19, early 1930s, around 1930 to 30, actually, they had actually been using the islands and, and exploiting the guano resources there for fertilizer. And, and Japan was using both um, Spratlys and, and the Paracels. Okay. Uh, China, on the other hand, 
was caught by surprise. And as far as they were concerned, these islands were in the South China Sea and therefore must be Chinese. Okay? And so there, they protested the French claim, even though, well, this is based also on the book of Bill Hinton, if you have a copy of that. Um, they had to find out where these islands were in order for them to decide whether they should protest or not. Clearly, they did not recognize the islands at the time. But that basically is the starting point of a three-cornered dispute. Japan, uh, mainland China, and the French. The Philippines did not enter the fray at this point. Okay? Uh, 1933, at best, what happened in the Philippines was that, uh, well, it was in the newspapers, and Senator Isabella de los Reyes wrote to the Governor General at the time, Governor General Frank Murphy, saying that, hey, these islands must be part of the Philippines. And therefore, the US government should protest the French claim. Okay? And this was published in the Tribune, a newspaper in general circulation. Uh, his letter was published in the Tribune. And sent to uh, the Governor General. Governor General dutifully sent it to the Secretary of State in Washington, and eventually they got a reply. The thing was that Governor De uh, sorry, uh, Senator De, De Los Reyes thought that these islands were within the Treaty of Paris boundaries. And when they looked at the boundaries, sorry, it's not inside the boundaries, because the Treaty of Paris boundaries are around here, and the line closest on the westernmost here was uh, happened to be here. So clearly they were outside. So the U.S. government officially replied to Senator De Los Reyes saying, sorry, they're clearly outside of the Treaty of Paris boundaries, and therefore it's not part of the Philippines. And that was it. Okay, that was it for uh, the Philippines at the time. Next slide, please. Now, oh, oh sorry. Oh, here. This is the drawing of Treaty Paris boundaries, by the way. Yeah. So it's clearly outside. Okay. Next slide, please. Next thing that happened was in 1939. Japanese took the islands when they took over Formosa, okay. and they based, and they placed. In this entire area, they drew this irregular polygon around it and then made specific features and said that this was now part of Formosa as the, and called it the Shinan Gunto Administrative Region, 1939, just before Second World War. The United States was apprised of this and they issued a response. The U.S. response was that in the U.S. opinion, in the United States opinion, the islands, rocks, and reefs, and that entire area could not be validly placed under the sovereignty of any nation. Why? Because it's open water, mostly open water. And then the reefs, they thought, could not be the subject of an appropriation claim. While the islands themselves, uh, the legitimate islands, the real islands, they thought that you know they, you cannot validly take over or, or take possession of these islands since they were already subject to French uh, rule by the time. Okay? So the United States state neutral, they did not recognize it, uh, they recognized the Japanese claim. And that now is the basis for the U.S. neutrality all over this entire dispute. No? So it began in 1939. The United States has always been neutral about this. Okay? And the position of the U.S. was that they did not recognize the claim, but they were not, uh, and, and they encouraged rather the various claimants, meaning uh, Japan, French, uh, France, and, and China, to resolve it peacefully and amicably in accordance with international law without the use of force. Okay? That was the original position at the time. Of course, this was part of what the other things that were going on, particularly the mobilization of Japan, resulting in a few years later in World War II. Okay? Uh, sorry, in uh, the, Pacific, the Pacific War, you know, which is part of World War II. Okay? So, but nonetheless, point to consider, Philippines still did not make any claim uh, to these islands at the time. Next slide, please. The next, the next major event took place only uh, more than, uh, a decade later, more than a decade later, 1956 after the war. No? Um, this time it was Thomas Cloma, a Buholano, who also happened to be a business associate apparently of Carlos Garcia, who was vice president at the time. And he came out in the newspapers, uh, he issued a formal notice to the whole world laying claim to this entire area and all the islands in there as, uh, as his own state, his own freedom land, with himself as the supreme, forget the term, the supreme leader or head of state, I think. 
Um, and the government he set up was based on Flat Island. Flat Island happens to be um, um, Ito Abayata. Okay? He knew that it had already been, uh, uh, no, no, wait, sorry to say, he claimed to have uh, acquired this through discovery. <laughs> but obviously, you cannot possibly have discovered this. It was already previously claimed, and it's already on the charts. In fact, uh, one of the embarrassing episodes for the Philippine government at the time was that uh, Cloma had found on Ito Aba the remains of a Taiwanese garrison with a Taiwanese flag flying over it. He took the flag home. No? He took the flag home and then put up the Philippine flag. Okay. So when he got home and reported this, made this notice to the world, etc., um, the Philippine government was a bit embarrassed because they had to return the Taiwanese flag to the embassy. Okay. So, of course, well, the Philippine government, however, basically reacted the same way you, you are now, which is to laugh at Cloma, laugh off Cloma, because he did not have official sanction. At best, he had personal sanction, personal encouragement, perhaps of Garcia. But officially, the Philippine government was not laying a claim to these islands and they disavowed any knowledge of the actions of law, mission impossible. <laughs> um, we did not take this seriously. The United States government also did not take it seriously because the reports of the U.S. Embassy was basically looking upon it in amusement, really, based on the letters that they sent. But the Taiwanese government, well, Chinese government in Taiwan, uh, took it very, very seriously and sent two destroyers to uh, Ito Aba to establish the garrison. No? And that garrison exists up to today. That is now on Ito Aba, that is the basis for Taiwan's continued occupation of Ito Aba. Cloma, on the other hand, was intercepted at some point and sent back to Manila by the Taiwanese. They were armed. I mean, Cloma and his associates were armed. Um, and uh, the Taiwanese government basically took their armaments and returned it to the Philippine government separately. Okay. Now, uh, again, um, neither the Philippine government nor the U.S. government uh, laid any Philippine claim to this area. Why did that happen? Well, during the war, what is not shown in this map is that during the war, the, the islands actually were subject of some discussions as to whether or not they should be, um, you know, after they're taken back from Japan, because this is among the areas that Japan conquered, there's some discussion as to who should the islands be given to uh, in the course of the research and preparation for the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty, which ended the Second, uh, Second World War, that was only 1951. No? As it happened, the United States, uh, this, after three studies were written up, the United States decided not to settle it anymore. Okay? Because they recognized that it was subject to competing claims between the French and mainland China, and then eventually Vietnam, because by the time they knew that Vietnam would be granted independence. Um, but they never regarded the Philippines as a claimant. Neither did the United States have any interest in claiming these islands. So they simply left it unresolved. And that's why in 1956, when Cloma took over these islands, or attempted to take them, you know, the Philippines could not do much except to say that, well, these were subject of talks during the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And since they were not expressly turned over to any party, you know, they became rest no use. They became the property of no one, essentially. And that left the door open to future Filipino opposition. That was the Philippine position. Okay. Next slide, please. Now, okay. And Mitra went back to Manila, reported that he was harassed by the Taiwanese, and that led to Philippine uh, government concern over what's going on in the region. Also, it coincided with the time that the United Nations had come out with a report about possible petroleum reserves uh, in the seabed, and it happened to also include the area in the South China Sea, and, and uh, where it stated that there probably were petroleum reserves in the South China Sea. This also occurred, confluence level events. 
This also occurred during the time that the Philippine government decided that there was need to promote oil exploration, but since the land did not appear to be conducive to oil uh, reserves, they had to look to the sea. And the promising area, even, back, even then, no, was already lead bank here. That was the most promising petroleum reserve area. And the Philippines wanted to explore that region. Okay. So what happened? As a measure of uh, probably to enhance security, the no? Philippine government decided sometime in 1916 or 69, it's unknown because it's, it was a secret operation, they decided to send the Marines to occupy the remaining islands in the South China Sea, leading to these locations here. So we made the move. And that now led to, with that, uh, we were able to secure essentially Filipino oil exploration on Green Bank as well as this area here. Uh, next slide, please. It took another decade or so before we formalized you know, that claim. Okay? Initially, we were just occupying it, and despite several incidents, there, was, there were even statements of the part of the government that we were not actually occupying it, but we were merely securing the area. Back in 1978, uh, President Marcos issued PD 5096, which is now the basis for the creation of the municipality of Kalayaan. And that is now what created the Kalayaan Island Group, you know, officially in, 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 in the Philippines. This became the Kalayaan Island Group of Islands, which is a municipality created as a municipality under the jurisdiction of Palawan. And that now, 1978, they, therefore, is the first official Philippine claim to this area. Okay. Next slide, please. And since that time, um, after that initial occupation, international law had also moved, no? because UNCLOS was, uh, had already begun to be negotiated in 72. By 1978, it became clear that some parts of it were going to be uh, part of the eventual agreement, and the most important part was the exclusive economic zone, okay? which is a jurisdictional claim to the waters up to 200 nautical miles. Seeing the usefulness of that concept, the Philippines also laid claim to the exclusive economic zone, extending 200 nautical miles from baselines, which encompass part of the Kalayan Island group. Okay. So you have here two possible, uh, well, two, le two laws, which are the basis of Philippine jurisdiction, PD-396 and um, PD-399 for the exclusive zone. So, okay. Now, of course, for, for lawyers and uh, love to see specialists, there are huge problems with that. No? But we will not discuss it uh, for now. Uh, as far as the Philippine government is concerned, as far as the law is concerned, those are the two uh, bases for our exercise of jurisdiction and claim to sovereignty over that area. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we are now before the arbitral tribunal, which was constituted in 2013, no? seeking uh, reliefs against China. And what we're trying to do, but the line, nine dash line is not here because the emphasis is on the Philippine position. What we're trying to do in that case is to essentially assert that we are entitled to this full area of 200 nautical miles, and therefore everything within it is exclusively Philippine jurisdiction. And no amount of, no number of lines can supersede that jurisdiction which is already under international law. Against that, China is claiming historic rights or historic title, and we're basically contesting that. We're saying that no, historic rights, historic title, that was superseded by UNCLOS. And therefore, we should be the ones entitled to exclusive rights over all of the resources within this region. On the other hand, with respect to the islands, we claim 12 nautical miles around the islands. And some of them are beyond our 200 nautical mile zone. So the territorial sea around those islands are under Philippine sovereignty jurisdiction. That is the position we are uh, taking. Okay? And therefore, China should go back to the mainland, no? essentially. Raise the 9 dash line and go back to the mainland. Of course, China is not giving up without a fight. And that's why we have current ongoing uh, tensions. Okay? Next slide, please. 